Welcome to Kaiser Watch with John Kaiser. I'm your host, Jim Goddard. John, welcome back to the show. Jim, happy to be back. Uh, Today we're going to talk about uh, how the resource juniors are finishing off the year, how my uh, uh, 2022 favorites have fared, and what I have planned for the 2023 bottom fish collection. John, how is the end of the year shaping up for the resource juniors? The resource juniors are in the final throes of the tax loss selling season. Uh, it's uh, been a pretty bad year that did start out quite promising in the first quarter for some juniors, but by the middle of the year, everything got dragged down by the general equity bear market. At the start of the year, 27% of TSX and TSX Venture listed resource companies were trading below 10 cents. But that had climbed to 42% by December 8th. And that's slightly less than the percentage at the end of November, which gives me hope that maybe the worst is over because there's been a lot of selling on the bid side during the past few months. Now, uh, I think this, uh, what, what's really interesting is that the traded value for resource listings on the TSX Venture Exchange has stayed 60 to 80 percent above or above 50 percent uh, for most of the year starting in December. Now, from 2012 on, for most of this period, the non-resource listings, they represented 60 to 80 percent of the traded value. And there were a couple of short-lived exceptions, uh, one in 2016 when we thought we had a resource sector turnaround with gold rallying, and another one in late 2017, and then the second half of 2020 when gold um, uh, breached uh, $2,000, the uh, resource juniors also managed to get above 50%, but that pretty much ended as 2021 arrived, Uh, but this has completely reversed, and what we're seeing in the past few weeks is that the traded value of the TSX Venture resource listings, it's now representing 74% of total traded value. And that's really interesting. And it's not just because the traded value of non-resource listings is declining, but it is because we are starting to see an increase in the traded values of resource juniors. Uh, So that gives me hope that perhaps for 2023, we will see what I thought would happen in 2022, which is that the resource juniors uh, um, unyoke from a general market malaise and outperform general equities. Now, we're also seeing an interesting trend in the average uh, share price traded, and uh, uh, it's it's still below 40 cents, uh, where it's been for most of the past decade for resource listings, compared to, say, the... Uh, 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 non-resource listings, uh, they have ranged, uh, you know, between 40 cents and, and a dollar 40 per day, uh, for most of this period, peaking, uh, late, late last year. But they are now almost equal, and it looks like the traded value of the non-resource listings is headed lower, and I think there is still more ugly tax loss selling happening for the, um, for the, uh, uh, non-resource listings. And, you know, to understand what's going on, you really just need to look at two charts. One is Hive Blockchain, which is into crypto mining. It is down 93% from its $36 peak in 2021. The other is Canopy Growth, which is down 94% uh, from its, uh, from the $72 peak in 2021. Crypto and cannabis, they were dominant themes during the past decade on the uh, amongst the non-resource listings on the TSX Venture Exchange. Bitcoin itself is down 73% from its $65,000 peak in 2021. And if you were to take gold from its 2030, 20, 2039 peak this year and knock it off 73%, it would be trading at $550 an ounce. And... That obviously is not happening. And, you know, gold did get into the 1600 to $1,700 range as the interest rates uh, cranked up, but it's now bouncing uh, just under the $1,800 level. 
And gold is proving a much more durable storehouse for value than the cryptocurrencies, which have been devastated by the collapse of the FTX exchange uh, in, in the past few weeks and the collapse of all kinds of other alternative uh, cryptocurrency tokens. Now, I think we might actually be heading into a, a stronger year. Uh, Xi Jinping has capitulated on his zero COVID policy. The Chinese economy was running only 3% GDP growth at the end of the third quarter. The last quarter is obviously not going to be any better. This endless lockdown has angered the Chinese people to the point where it has become potentially disruptive for Xi Jinping's status as uh, emperor for life. And uh, and they have started to ease the policy. The uh, sacrifice, it's estimated that a, about a million people, largely elderly Chinese, may die over this winter as they catch COVID. The hospital system is not set up to uh, you know, handle a sudden influx of everybody catching, catching Omicron. And we're already seeing the reports that, yes, the, the, the infections are rising. It's spreading. Uh, when the Lunar New Year happens next month uh, and everybody travels, uh, they'll go back to their home in the hinterland and bring whatever it is they caught in the cities. So Xi Jinping has a big problem on his hand, but he also realizes he has to turn the economy around. And uh, when I started off my uh, 2022 bottom fish collection, um, I was of the view that uh, the resource juniors would end up outperforming the general equity market downturn because there had been a decade-long bear market for metal prices during which the producers uh, were very reluctant to develop new mines. They were happy to let the supply-demand imbalances rise, bring the price up, increase the profit margins from existing operations, but they were reluctant to go on a development and acquisition binge and develop new mines. And this is going to be a problem if the macroeconomic trend of the global economy continues, uh, develops an uptrend, if it survives this recession. But it's also these new usages from the energy transition, new demand coming, which uh, is not really accounted for by the supply pipeline that's in place. So if China manages to survive a uh, uh, the, the COVID uh, uh, infection that's going to happen and get its economy turned around and adapt to living with COVID as something that's annoying and in the background, uh, then we could start seeing the prices of commodities rise. And we have started seeing this happen to some degree. Copper has bounced off. It's 350, 350 low. Nickel has bounced off. And uh, this, this issue, um, this could seriously... Uh, uh, create a, a foundation for the resource juniors to do much better in 2023 than 2022. John, how have things worked out for your 2022 favorites? Will any of them make it to the 2023 favorites collection? It's been a terrible year for my uh, uh, the eight companies on my favorites uh, index for collection for 2022. It's down 39%, which means it's even worse than the TSX Venture Index, which is down 38%, and gold's only down 1.7% from the start of the year. So this has been a very, very unhappy, unhappy year. And there's only two of my uh, favorites that I have any uh, real desire to continue as part of the 2023 collection of favorites. And that is Verde Agritech, which um, uh, did extremely well this year. It's still up around 70 74 uh, percent. Uh, the other is FPX Nickel, which is down 9 percent, but it has just completed an important financing that gives it $18 million working capital that'll take it right through into 2024 and enable it to deliver the pre-feasibility study and achieve all the milestones with regard to its uh, pilot plant study for the primary flow sheet and also the hydromet uh, flow sheet uh, that we expect sometime in the first quarter of next year that will demonstrate that they can make battery grade nickel and cobalt sulfate. And Verde Agritech, uh, it had a huge race to uh, get its uh, 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 2.4 million ton per annum plant built. And uh, it didn't quite make it in time to deliver during the uh, 
uh, the third quarter or the product that it had promised to deliver. But that is now operational, and uh, they're guiding 2 million tons for next year out of that 3 million ton capacity. And if they were to achieve that at the sort of prices that we're still getting per ton of K Forte, we're talking about a company that's going to have $200 million revenue if they are able to demonstrate that, the, yes, we can sell K Forte as an alternative potash fertilizer to the um, farmers in Brazil. If they can demonstrate that, I think Verde Agritech uh, next year, especially with the help of a NASDAQ listing if they get it, will do really well. And the same is with FPX Nickel. I think it will do extremely well next year. It's now financed on this cloud of uh, will they have enough money to deliver the PFS. Uh, that's gone. And they have a strategic investor in place, which um, you know, if you listen to the way Martin Turin talks, it makes you strongly suggest that it is not a mining company, but one of the uh, the downstream entities that either make uh, uh, battery chemicals or uh, or the batteries themselves, and maybe even uh, uh, a, a a car maker such as a Tesla or an Apple, which is breaking trying to break into the uh, EV game, making sure that they have a a supply of nickel and cobalt sulfate down the road, and of course that investment it's an it, it's a no-brainer in the sense that uh, if this flow sheet works, all the output can go to the stainless steel market. That it doesn't have to go to the to the battery market um, by 2030 when this would be operational. So those two definitely are going to be continued. The rest I'm not so sure about. Uh, SK Mining is the one that uh, gives me the greatest concern right now. They have not reported any assays for all the drilling that they did on the SK project in the Golden Triangle. Uh, that's usually not something uh, uh, that, that gets done if there is good results that are in there that make a difference. So that stock is sort of hanging around the dollar, dollar ten level, and it is in danger of, uh, of dropping substantially if when they finally put out the batch results, there is nothing in there to make the market think that they have an emerging discovery. My greatest hope is that Scarlet Ridge, where they did report getting lots of good geological context with sulfides, that they have something there. I doubt there's a whole 109 uh, sitting in that batch of core that uh, will you know, signal, ooh, we have another, we have a B-zone clone, another SK Creek. So that stock uh, will probably end up in the bottom fish category uh, for the, my for my 2023 collection. Uh, Galway Metals, uh, that's also one that is turning out to be quite a disappointment. It's down 65%, even though they reported a 2 million ounce resource. I did an outcome visualization that's based on First Marathon's Val, uh, Marathon val, val, Valentine project in Newfoundland, which is very similar. And that came in at about $500 million after-tax NPV Canadian at 8%. And that's after I bumped up the CapEx uh, after we saw that Marathon had to do the same for Valentine. But this week, uh, Galway Metals announced that it had suspended drilling at Clarence Stream to, to preserve cash and to allow results to catch up. And the market was not happy with that. So this is a good sort of story for bottom fishing. If we do get a strong gold market in 2023, that will certainly help Galway Metals. But for now, I'm not very sure that I will continue it as a as a favorite. Uh, Northwest Copper, which has the uh, Stardust Quanica Advanced Project uh, in, in British Columbia, as well as the East Nev Exploration Project, uh, it's the worst performer, down 74% so far. And uh, part of the damage to the stock uh, is due to uh, Marco Day's Oxygen Capital Group uh, suffering fallout from the implosion of pure gold mining this year. But it's also been hurt by the decline of copper from 450 a pound at the start of the year down to 350 per pound. They are supposed to be delivering a PEA for a combined uh, underground stardust mining operation with open pit mining at the at the at the Quanica deposit, uh, we would have liked to have seen that by now. Uh, I doubt that we'll get it before the end of the end of the year. Uh, we are still waiting for the assays on the East Nev drilling where they drilled eight holes. That's a potential emerging copper gold discovery. But at the moment, uh, 
I'm, I, I really would like to see what the PEA looks like, what they have come up with. The stock is cheap here in the 20 to 30 cent range. So at a minimum, it will be part of my 2023 uh, bottom fish collection, but not sure that it will make it to the uh, uh, 2023 favorites list. Uh, Perpetua Gold, it's it, it's now down only 53% from the start of the year. They are in the comment period for the environmental impact statement process. Uh, but my big concern is that the feasibility study delivered in 2020 is now stale. And when I've run that DCF model with a 20% CapEx and OpEx uh, escalation, uh, it needs $2,000 gold to be worth developing. So Perpetua Gold, even if they finally get through this permitting permitting treadmill, uh, they're going to have to give us an updated feasibility study, and we will have to see how much uh, more it's going to cost to produce uh, gold and antimony from the Stibnite project in, in Idaho. So I will probably consign that one to the bottom fish collection and not continue it as a uh, as as a uh, uh, a favorite in 2023. And P2 Gold, similar to uh, 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 Northwest Copper, which uh, it, it has the uh, GABS Copper Gold Project uh, in Nevada. It was supposed to have a PEA done, which uses a combination of, uh, you know, optimizing the ore schedule and stage development, where you start with the cheaper capex heap leaching and then transition to the milling of the, de of the, of the sulfides from the, from the copper ore. They have not yet published the PEA, and uh, the decline of copper from 450 to 350 has not been particularly helpful. And uh, they are struggling right now to do a million dollar financing at 27 cents per unit. The unit that started off with half a warrant has now been increased to a full warrant. The big thing hanging over the market is that there are big uh, uh, payments due. In, in, in May to Waterton, the source of the GABS project. Waterton itself, Global, is being uh, uh, wound down, and several of the uh, principals are starting a new fund called Kintera Capital, and they've been extremely busy with that, and, and the P2 Gold is hoping that they can get an extension on the payments that are due, uh, due in May of next year, but the market's assuming Waterton is going to be hard-nosed, Kintera is being packaged as a battery metals fund, trying apparently trying to raise a half billion dollars to invest in various uh, projects. But the GABS project does qualify for battery metals because of the copper content, less so the gold, the gold content. So we'll have to see if they get an extension of the payment deadline, keep the GABS project alive, then see the PEA in the in the new year and see what it, what sort of copper and gold prices are needed to make that work. And the BAM project, they've just reported the results from all the, the near-surface drilling that they have, and they'll be producing a resource estimate uh, sometime in, in Q1 of next year. And they think there could be 2 to 4 million ounces there. It's going to be low-grade, probably 1 gram, 1 gram per ton. Its location is better than Galore Creek itself. Um, it's basically along what the road would be to get to Galore Creek. Uh, but what was frustrating with the uh, BAM project was the geophysical surveys that they needed to do. It took them a long time to get those done because of uh, visibility problems. They did get these surveys done. And, and the real prize at BAM, and this is in the Golden Triangle, is the feeder system that uh, fed this um, you know, low-grade gold mineralization at surface. They believe there's this, the grades could be substantially richer supporting an underground mine. They are still processing all this data, and we probably won't get the uh, final modeled uh, 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 hypothesis as to where the target is. But they do, they are very ambitious. They want to go back with an $8 million program next year, uh, do another sort of 14,000 meters of drilling, 70% of which will be allocated for the, the deeper feeder feeder target, and uh, this will be their challenge in the new year to, to raise that capital. They're probably not going to try doing it now because the stock is is suffering from tax loss selling, which uh, I suspect is actually flow-through fund liquidation because they did raise a bunch of money from, from flow-through. 
Uh, but this one, I, given the uncertainty about GABs, I'm going to not continue as a favorite, but it will be part of my 2023 bottom fish collection. And the final one, Orion Resources, uh, uh, which uh, I haven't yet decided whether to continue it. It definitely would qualify for the for the 2023 bottom fish collection. Um, this year, they put most of their money into the 7030 joint venture with uh, B2 Gold on the Kutu Voma project, uh, which is right next to the uh, Ikari project of Rupert Resources. And in the past week, uh, Rupert uh, produced a PEA for a 10,000 ton per day uh, milling operation, which the first 11 years will be open pit mining, then they'll transition to, to underground mining at a 5% uh, discount rate. That came in at the U.S. Uh, $1.6 billion after-tax NPV uh, using 1650 gold. And it had only a capex of 404 million. So, so this is really, really interesting. The market pricing the project at about a billion dollars, so roughly half of what the uh, uh, in, in, in indicated uh, NPV is, which is, of course, they need to do the feasibility study next uh, next stage. So we're heading into the value trough there. But Orion, uh, what it did a lot of work this year on on this 100% RISTI project, which is just to the south of the Rupert's project and in east of the uh, JV with B2 Gold. Most of the past work is focused on the outcropping area where they have these high-grade gold veins. None of it really has yielded a zone where you can you know, come up with a resource estimate. But a lot of the property is covered by overburden, and that was the key for finding Ikari. They used a sort of a till, rotary till dirt sampling strategy uh, to find that particular target. So. Uh, Orion did a lot of work this year to generate new targets, and next year we may see this uh, the RISTI project uh, get some uh, uh, brand new targets developed. Uh, the I think Orion Resources itself is probably a takeout target, uh, mm. either by Rupert uh, acquiring it, though Orion wouldn't want to do that at current price relative prices, uh, but eventually also by B2 Gold. So. This one, Orion still has lots of money left. Uh, uh, management has been buying stock in the open market, so they're clearly pretty optimistic about it. And uh, I, I, have, I, I, I may continue that one as a KRO favorite uh, for, for 2023. John, what criteria are driving your choices for the 2023 bottom fish collection? Well, last year... During this sort of November, December period, and as I mentioned earlier, I was quite optimistic that the resource sector would buck the general market downtrend. That proved to be incorrect. But based on my assumption that it's finally going to be time for resource juniors to flourish, I tagged about 160 companies as bottom fish. This year, I'm taking a different approach. Uh, because of the uncertainty about how deep a recession will be and uh, um, what this will do for, for metal prices and investor investor capital, I am o I'm producing a much smaller collection. Last year it was about 160. This year it will probably be maybe 50, 50, 60 companies. And I'm sticking to companies where I've become familiar with management and the story. Uh, the, in terms of working capital on the on the venture exchange, there's about you know half of the resource listings have anywhere from five hundred thousand dollars to uh, you know twenty fifty million dollars working capital. Uh, those are the target. There's another hundred and eighty or so companies that have between zero and five hundred thousand dollars. This is a very difficult financing environment that that we're in. But what's uh, staggering is that the uh, there's three billion dollars owed by resource juniors, and and 2.5 billion of that is owed by juniors trading below a dime. Now a lot of the companies are trading trading below a dime. It's about uh, you know over 50 percent for the uh, TSX venture listings. So sifting through that's going to be very important. Now two thirds of the listings have a December 31st year end, which means that the the, the September 30th court financials only became due at the end of November, so I'm still getting all that input. I won't know for a couple of weeks what all those balance sheets uh, really look like. 
Uh, so I'm sticking to companies where there is an emerging discovery type story. And I've talked about this, uh, you know, earlier this year that in a bearish market like this, you can see results that aren't like a, a no-brainer discovery hole, but whose geological context tells you, oh, they are on the edge of a something significant. So these types of companies, these types of stories, I think, can flourish next year if the companies are able to, to continue drilling and show that, hey, this discovery is real and the company is, is underpriced because of this glass half full attitude. But the other thing that I'm really focusing on for my 2023 bottom fish collection is the lithium space. Uh, lithium is the one metal that has done extremely well this year because the electric vehicle rollout has been tremendous. Uh, it's now unstoppable. They've gone beyond the point of no return. $36 a pound lithium carbonate is not sustainable for the long run. But all these economic studies that we're seeing coming out, they're using something between like $10, $10 $15 a pound for the long run. And that's, that's going to be the minimum that the, uh, the mining sector needs in order to deliver the lithium that will be required for the, you know, the, by 2030 when they really expect the sales to go exponential. So the, the, the lithium mania 2.0 is, uh, I think really going to get legs in 2023. So I'm scouring the system for the serious juniors that have meaningful pegmatite projects that are being generated on the basis of geology, not just proximity to existing uh, pegmatite deposits. And those are the ones that uh, uh, I think are going to be most interesting because even if, uh, you know, the emerging discoveries, you're never sure that they will actually confirm it as a major discovery. And we may get a weak metal prices uh, in, in general next year, continuing as the recession bites and real estate prices start to come down and, and capital, capital, risk capital vanishes. But the lithium space, it's going to be an island unto itself. And I think it will buck the trend because the car companies are not going to stop their plans for uh, rolling out their electric vehicle fleets uh, just because we have a recession, which we know the Fed will eventually fix by dropping interest rates really low again. So lithium juniors, especially with a pegmatite focus, those are going to be an important part of my 2023 bottom fish collection. John, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome, Jim. We've been speaking with John Kaiser. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Kaiser Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as a recommendation to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at kaiserresearch.com.